All right, welcome everybody. I'm very excited to be here again. My name is Andrea Decker and I have the pleasure of representing the Fleet Science Center for another Sky Tonight Planetarium show with our resident astronomer, Dr. Lisa Will. If you've been with us before, thank you so much for coming back, for joining us again. If this is your first time, welcome. We're excited to see you. Um, you will hear lots of good stuff tonight. I'm gonna explain a little bit about how um, this talk is set up. Just as a, little as a little information for people who have not heard of Sky Tonight before tonight, this is our planetarium show that we normally host at our dome theater in this beautiful building on that side in Balboa Park at the Fleet Science Center. Um, and of course the pandemic has uh, not allowed us to do that for a while. So we switched to virtual so that we can still engage with everybody and still bring astronomy to everybody who's interested in it. Um, but of course it's a little different than the live shows and I'm super excited to announce, drum roll, that we are going back to in-person Sky Tonight shows. We're starting in July, very excited. And so here's a little preface though. We're going to start in person in July. At seven o'clock, we'll have one Sky Tonight show. Normally, we have two at seven and at eight fifteen, but the second one we will continue virtually because we made some friends online who won't be able to join us um, in person. So we're going to keep the second show online for now, and that has a second pur purpose because we do have to do some work uh, later in the summer on the dome. So we will have to close that dome again for a month or two, and then we will um, do the shows again virtually. So we're keeping both right now until the dome is fully open without any work scheduled, you know, everything is done and then we'll just be in person again. There will unfortunately be no more planetarium virtually. I know, it, it's kind of bittersweet. I, I'm very much looking forward to going in person, but I've really liked the opportunity to interact with people who are not in San Diego and who still enjoy astronomy and um, that has yeah, that really liked the show and that has meant a lot to them. So, all right, with that little introduction, I'm just going to turn it over to Lisa so that she can take it away. She's going to tell us a little bit about the sky tonight, what's uh, what you can see if you go out after this show. Um, actually, I think you said it at nine o'clock, don't you? Because it's I, I, I said it at nine o'clock to give the sun plenty of time to go down. Exactly. So when you go out at nine tonight, you will know exactly what you're looking at after Lisa's presentation. She also will give us some um, planetary and astro astronomy news. Um, and then she will dive into the topic of the night, which is the Kuiper Belt. So Lisa, why don't you take it away? Awesome. Thank you so much. And once again, welcome to the sky tonight. We are so happy to be able to present this to you and uh, I'll be happy to uh, go back into the dome, but I will miss uh, being able to, to do this here. And um, I have, uh, I, I'm, I'm very excited though to talk to you about Kuiper Belt objects tonight and I probably prepared too many slides. So I'll, I'll try not to talk too fast, but it's so cool out there. Okay. But first we got to start talking about some um, astronomy in the news. So I guess I should actually share my screen. There we go. All right. So uh, on June 20th is the summer solstice. So that's going to be June 20th, our time here in San Diego. And the summer solstice is when the sun is at its highest altitude in the sky at noon from our location. Um, the earth is uh, tilted at about 23 and a half degrees and during the summer for us here in June, we are tilted towards the sun, but you'll notice the southern hemisphere is tilted away. So while we're entering uh, summer this month, uh, the southern hemisphere is entering winter. And so it's the tilt that causes the two hemispheres to have opposite seasons. And then also um, just a reminder that we are actually at our farthest distance from the sun in July. And so the distance is not the reason for the seasons. It's the tilt of the earth on its axis. And then here, um, there was a total lunar eclipse that was uh, a, a couple days ago, actually, it was just last week that I don't know about you, but I had marine layer, so I couldn't see it. But online, um, I saw this beautiful image on Twitter from uh, where uh, Yuri, uh, Yuri Belitsky caught this image of the eclipsed moon over the uh, European Southern Observatory's Paranal Observatory in Chile. And I just thought this was a really lovely image to show you of last week's lunar eclipse in case you didn't get a chance to see it. 
In terms of looking at the sky, though, um, Julian made the news this past month um, because they have been designated an international dark sky city uh, from the International Dark Sky Association. Um, what they do, uh, what that association does is they establish some criteria that um, uh, for how you can actually minimize the light pollution in your location. Uh, Julian is only the second city in California to receive this designation. And so what that means is that when you go up there, um, the lighting that we that we want near the ground stays towards the ground and doesn't get pointed up towards the sky. So congratulations to Julian for all of their efforts on uh, getting that dark sky designation. Um, and then um, in, in May, on May 10th, um, the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft mission left the asteroid Bennu on its way back towards Earth to return samples of this asteroid. And this is the last image of Bennu that was taken as the, uh, as, uh, the spacecraft was moving away from it. Um, but it won't be quick to get these samples back. It'll actually be in September 2023, but the samples of this asteroid are now back on their way to us. Um, and so as one mission is ending, though, uh, today two missions were announced. And so NASA runs a, a what they call a discovery program, a, a certain level of funding for missions. And two were getting funded in this round, and it was the Da Vinci Plus and the Veritas missions, both of them to Venus. And so it's been the first time that we'll have gone back to Venus in a long time. The last time NASA has sent a robotic spacecraft to Venus was the Magellan spacecraft, which was an amazing, got a lot of great data, um, but we haven't sent anything back since. And so what the, and these two will work well together. The Da Vinci spacecraft will be focusing on studying Venus's atmosphere, and the Veritas one will be uh, focusing on studying the geology of Venus. And so um, the, so funding was announced today. It'll take about a decade for them to get off the ground, but now they know they can go ahead and start building out these programs. So that's just some of the stuff going on in astronomy news currently. Now let's do a tour of the sky. And so this is what the sky will look like around nine o'clock tonight. If you don't have marine layer, I can't remember the last time I've seen the sun personally where I'm located in San Diego. Um, and so to give you an idea of what you're looking at on the sky, north is to the top of the screen, south is to the bottom of the screen, east is to your left, and west is to the right. And so uh, the point directly overhead is actually in the middle of the screen. So when, when we go outside and we look at the stars at night, we know that uh, there are constellations above us. And the constellations above us are usually depicted in these beautiful artistic drawings. And I don't know if you're anything like me when you go outside, I, just, I don't see where they got these at all, right? But um, we do have these beautiful constellations above us and I will talk to you about the mythology of some of them. But you don't see the illustrations when you go outside at night, but you do what the human, human brain wants to do, which is to connect the dots. The human brain likes to find patterns and data and so if you look up at the nighttime sky, this is more like what you'll see, right? You will make those connections between the stars. And so what I will do now is tell you some of the stories behind these connections and uh, help you see what was up in the sky tonight. And we'll start with uh, perhaps the most famous of the constellations that is up tonight, which is Ursa, Ursa Major up in the northern part of the sky. It's the Great Bear. Um, it is the third largest of the 88 constellations that astron astronomers uh, use when we talk about the sky. Um, now, you might be saying to yourself, Ursa Major, why is that the, the most famous constellation that is up in the night sky, or at least that you've heard of? Well, you've probably heard of it as the Big Dipper. Um, the Big Dipper is what we call an asterism. It is not a constellation, but it is a a portion of a constellation or multiple constellations. Some asterisms uh, are involve stars from multiple constellations. And so the Big Dipper is easy to find in the nighttime sky, uh, even in the, in the northern part of the sky, uh, even from a metropolitan area like San Diego at this time of year is when it's uh, towards its highest uh, elevation or altitude above the horizon. So at nine o'clock tonight, if you have clear skies, go take a look for the Big Dipper. Um, the 
Now let's go towards another large constellation, but maybe one you haven't heard of or haven't even looked for, which is Hydra. Um, Hydra is the largest of the constellations, and you can see it here taking up a huge part of the southern sky. Um, but the dots it's connecting aren't very bright. In fact, the brightest star in Hydra is named Alfard, who's, and the name is a derivative of an Arabic term that means the solitary one, because it's that, that one bright star over in that area of the sky. So it really gives you a feel for the, the location of it. Um, that particular star is about 180 light years from our solar system. So what does that mean? A light year is the distance that light travels in a year. And so if a star is 180 light years away, that makes that means it took 180 years for its light to get to us. So we're not seeing it as it is, but rather as it was 180 years ago, which is one of those things I've always found to be really sort of awesome is that when you look up into the sky, you're actually looking back in time. I've always enjoyed that part, as, as weird as it might seem. Now, to fully tell the tale of the Hydra up in the sky, I'm going to involve a couple more constellations. And these you may never have heard of. Um, there's Corvus and Crater. Corvus the Crow and Crater the Cup. And so what do these have to do with Hydra? Well, Corvus is associated with a crow that the god Apollo sent with a cup to fetch him some water. All right, so that's the crow and the cup together. The crow took his sweet time. As part of the myth, it's even said he stopped for a snack. Traditionally, it's, he, it says that he stopped to eat, to eat some figs. And then when he came back, he realized, like, I didn't get Apollo his water. I'm going to have to make an excuse. So I'm going to grab this here sea snake. And I'm going to say, look, I couldn't get you your water because of this snake. But Apollo, being a god, looked at the situation and knew the crow was lying. So he threw the sea snake, the cup, and the crow all up in the sky. And you'll notice that the cup is just forever out of reach of the crow so that the crow will now always be thirsty. And so um, I like to tell the story for a couple different reasons. Um, first of all, uh, we all seem to know that constellations represent stories, uh, but the stories aren't always individual stories. Sometimes the stories are contextualized in their references to other constellations. So you have to admit Hydra the sea snake got a lot more interesting which, once we tied it together with the crow and the cup. And then in a lot of those stories where the constellations are tied together, they're about petty vengeance. And so I actually find that really interesting. There's a lot of revenge stories up on the sky, which I guess tells you a bit about the mythology we choose to immortalize in the stars. So a constellation up in the sky named after a famous hero is Hercules. It is the fifth largest constellation. Um, the brightest star in Hercules is named Carnophoros, and that is a Greek term for club bearer because Hercules is often depicted with a club that he's holding above his head. Um, and so uh, that star is about 140 light years from our solar system. And then we have Bootes, the herdsman. And so what Bootes is, the people often say it looks like a kite. I still don't see a person. Okay, well, let's, let's just admit there's, there's no person in this shape, right? But, well, but uh, some people refer to this as the kite. I think of it as an ice cream cone with the brightest star at the base of the ice cream cone. I know it's, it's a summer, it's a springtime and summer constellation, right? So it just makes sense to me. Um, that bright star Arcturus, um, the name comes from a phrase that means guardian of the bear. And so Arcturus is probably named because of its proximity to Ursa Major up in the sky. And it is one of the brighter stars you can see in the spring and early summertime sky. And so if you've gone outside over the last couple of months and you've looked up, um, you've undoubtedly seen Arcturus. Um, and it is uh, a star that's about 37 light years from our solar system. So uh, closer than the other distances we've mentioned so far. And then now let's talk about one of the constellations that's rising over in the southeastern horizon, and that is Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer, usually depicted as a man holding a snake in his hands. And it is also referred to as the 13th sign of the zodiac. And so I want to talk to you about the zodiac now. And I want you just to kind of remember where Ophiuchus 
is and where the southernmost part of it is. And then you'll understand why it's the 13th sign of the zodiac. So here are the traditional zodiac signs that are up tonight. We have Scorpius. Its name is cut off, but I wanted to mention Scorpius tonight. So we have Scorpius rising over in the southeast. And we have Gemini setting over in the southwest. Excuse me. Yeah, southwest. With uh, actually over in the west, getting to the northwest. Uh, with Libra, Virgo, uh, Leo, and Cancer between them. And why are these the zodiac signs? Well, let me put this line up there. And now you see that that green line would be going through Ophiuchus over along the eastern horizon. Uh, if you look closely, you might be able to see that there are months of the year listed along this green line. This line marks the ecliptic, which is the apparent path of the sun on the sky. Um, it's where we see the sun against the stars from our perspective as we revolve around the sun. And so what you're seeing up there is the location of the sun on any given day of the year. And so since we have this set for around nine o'clock tonight and we're at the beginning of June, the beginning of June is already setting below the Western horizon. And so that's the, the presence of the sun, the fact that the sun moves through these constellations is why these constellations uh, got their cultural significance. Um, other constellations, I mean, a lot of the constellations we've talked around tonight were first cataloged a couple thousand years ago, and you know, almost 2,000 years ago. And so these constellations, their stars maintain their placements with respect to each other for really long periods of time, but the sun moves through them. The sun doesn't belong to a constellation. The planets and the moon also move through these constellations as well. And so these are the constellations that showed changes while the others remained steady. And that's why these constellations became important. So let's talk about these signs of the zodiac, starting with Scorpius over in the east. And uh, Scorpius, I wanted to mention uh, simply because its brightest star, that red dot that is rising above the southeast there, is called Antares, and it's a supergiant star. It's huge. If you were to put Antares in our solar system where our sun is, um, it would actually be so, so large that Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars would be inside of it. That's how big it is. So it's an example of a red supergiant star. Um, the scorpion comes from, a, is associated with Apollo in mythology. Um, Scorpius is a summer constellation, Apollo is a winter constellation, and so it is said that every winter Orion hunts the sky, but he flees as the scorpion rises, so as the scorpion can chase him. So they're always opposite each other and can never catch each other on the sky. The next sign of the zodiac to the west is Libra, which represents a balance or scales. It's the only sign of the zodiac that's not named after a living creature. And it's really faint. It would be hard for us to go outside and basically oh, go, oh, oh, yeah, that's obviously Libra. Um, the brightest star um, is named Zubinel Ganubi, which is an Arabic term that refers to a southern claw. Now, scales don't have a claw, but a scorpion can be depicted with a claw. And so parts of Libra used to be parts of the constellation Scorpius. And it just kind of reminds us that as we have um, redrawn the constellations over the years, it's not that the constellations have changed their shapes, but some things have gotten shifted around over the centuries as we have redrawn our constellations. The next sign of the zodiac over to the west is Virgo, the maiden. Um, it's the second largest constellation in the sky and its brightest star Spica is in the top 15 brightest stars visible in the evening sky from the earth. Um, and that's pretty impressive considering it's about 260 light years away from us. Um, and so it's an example of something that we call a blue giant star. Giant meaning it's physically large and blue means it has a hot temperature. And so it's uh, putting out a lot of light between those two characteristics. The next sign of the zodiac over to the west is Leo, the lion, and the, Leo has a lot of bright stars. And so even from a large metropolitan area like San Diego, you can pick out Leo in the sky. We have that backwards looking question mark structure in the front marking the head and lot of the lion. And we have a triangle of stars uh, marking the tail of the lion. The brightest star in Leo is the one at the base of that backwards question mark. Its name is Regulus, or uh, which refers to Prince or Little King, and it's about 77 light years from our solar system. 
And then the next sign of the zodiac over is cancer, the crab. And it's really faint. It's the faintest of all the zodiac signs. Like if you and I were to go outside tonight and try to look for cancer up on the sky, I'd say, let's look between Leo and Gemini. Let's look in that dark region between Leo and Gemini. And that's where we're going to find this. Um, so it's not very easy uh, to see from a city at all. So you might be wondering, who is this crab in mythology? Well, this is a crab that bit Hercules when he was fighting the Hydra. And so he killed it. But Hera, who didn't like Hercules, or technically Hera would not have liked Heracles, mixing our Greek and Roman names, um, because she didn't like him, she decided, I'm just going to put that crab and make him immortal up in the sky so he's always there to vex you. And so that's what kind of what happened there. So once again, petty revenge up on the sky. And then the last sign of the zodiac setting over in the west and in, uh, in the last constellation I'll talk to you about tonight is Gemini, the twins. Um, named so because those two bright stars near the letter G up on the screen. Uh, they are named Castor and Pollux after the famous twins from Roman mythology. And um, they're named because they look like twins up on the sky. And uh, even predating Roman mythology in Babylonian astronomy, the, this area of the sky was named the Great Twins. And so I like that because that means that these two stars have looked the same to people for a couple of thousand years. And it gives you an idea of the long lifetimes of stars and how steady that they can appear in our sky, even though we know that they can change over time, but that their lifetimes are really long. Now, over in Gemini tonight, we have Mars. And so you can see where Mars is along the ecliptic. And so uh, Venus is in Gemini tonight, too, but it will have set uh, by the time you get out there at nine o'clock tonight, or it'll be really low. And then uh, Mercury is in Taurus, and Mercury and Venus were are visible just after sunset uh, earlier this month, but you can still try to glimpse Venus after sunset. But the only one up at nine o'clock tonight is Mars. And so Mars is always in the news. So let's talk about some uh, recent news about Mars. Um, this news is actually more about the spacecraft mission itself. The uh, United Arab Emirates sent its first spacecraft to Mars this past winter, and this is some of the first data that they've released. And so we can see image data over on the left and temperature data over on the right. Um, so their spacecraft is alive and well and functioning, and uh, all data will be released to the public in October. But they just wanted to make sure that people could see that is, this is going on at Mars. And then China landed its first rover on the surface of Mars this past month as well. And so on May 19th, these uh, two images were released. Uh, the one on the left shows uh, where the rover was still on its landing platform and then the ramp that it took to roll down to get to the ground. And then you can see the rover on the ground where it landed in Utopia Planitia. And so this rover has not yet really started roving around Mars yet, but it is on its way. And then I just had to show you a couple pretty images, uh, actually from the Curiosity rover. Um, Curiosity has been taking images of clouds in the sky. So this looks like the marine layer got all the way out to Anza Borrego, but that's not what's happening here. This is actually uh, cloudy days above Gale Crater on Mars. And so I wanted to show you this. And this next one, you'll just see cloud movement here. I just had to show you this GIF of cloud movement. Um, Martian clouds uh, can be made out of water ice or CO2 ice. And um, most of the time, what we observe, things that actually look like clouds are water ice. But some of these are at higher altitudes. Um, so we're seeing sort of lower, lower altitude clouds and higher altitude clouds. So we're seeing water ice clouds and we're glimpsing some of the carbon dioxide ice clouds too, which is kind of awesome. So I, uh, so they're still trying to look at more data for sure to try to say which of these is the water ice and which of these is the dry ice. So carbon dioxide ice is what you commonly play with as dry ice. So I had to show you clouds on Mars. And you're probably thinking, don't we have enough Meg, Gray, and June gloom around here? More clouds, more clouds on Mars I had to share. Means moving to Mars will not get you away from Meg, Gray, or June gloom. So there's It that. will not. It will not. 
Although to me, um, one of the things that's always been fascinating about the rover missions to Mars is that they make Mars look so familiar. And there's just something about seeing those clouds in the sky that make Mars even look more like home than usual. So I love, I was just pouring through the different images of the clouds. And so that's Mars. And as you can see, uh, a lot of international space agencies are studying Mars. And so one of the closest celestial objects to us, a lot of spacecraft missions, but what about some of the farthest objects from us in the solar system? And that's what we want to talk about tonight, those distant ones that we've actually barely had a chance to visit. And these are what we call the Kuiper Belt objects. Okay, so this is a lot of dots, but let me tell you what you're looking at here. That yellow star all the way in the center is the sun. The blue, um, the blueish uh, circles, they're actually ellipses, circles are the orbits of the outer planets. So the innermost one is Jupiter, then Saturn, then Uranus, then Neptune. So all of those red and white objects that you see out uh, beyond Neptune are comets and what we call Kuiper Belt objects, objects that orbit out past the orbit of Neptune. Uh, this is where Pluto is. So Pluto would be a Kuiper Belt object. So there's a whole lot of things out there and I want to talk to you a little bit about them. We'll talk uh, a bit about Pluto as well. And we'll also talk about the one spacecraft mission that we've sent out to the Kuiper Belt. So as you can tell, these objects are way far out there. I mean, trying to get an image of Pluto from the Earth is hard. If these objects are most of them, almost all of them are smaller than Pluto, they're really hard to observe from the Earth. So when we really started getting an idea of how many things were out there and starting to study them individually uh, was in the 90s and uh, 2000s uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope. And a lot of this work has actually been done at Palomar here in San Diego County. And so these are the discovery images of an object known as QAR. And so the way you tell, let's actually make that go again. So the way you tell whether or not something is a solar system object is remember how we were just talking about how constellations, they, they keep their shapes, right? So when you see an object move against the background of stars, it is very likely a member of our solar system. So you take images of the same part of the sky and you look to see if anything moves and that's how we discover these objects. And so after discovering that dot, uh, they could study the dot more. And what they determined was it's over half the size of Pluto. Now here's the earth, our moon and Pluto in Kuwar to scale. And once again, I would just like to point out that Pluto is smaller than our own moon. So those of you who are out there getting defensive of Pluto, right? If Pluto's Pluto's okay, but Pluto's very small. And so that's one of the reasons why it has a new designation. All right. So um, after Quar was discovered, because you have to admit, once you see something that big, you have to ask yourself, if Pluto's a planet, then is Quar a planet? Because the, this object was discovered back when Pluto still had its planet designation. And it's part of the reason why Pluto lost its designation. Don't be upset at Quar. And so now we're going, this is an artist's representation of an object known as Sedna. Oh, and that bright white dot over on the right-hand side, that's the sun. And so that's how far out in these in the solar system these objects are. They're so far away that the sun is a bright dot in the sky. And so if you had grown up on Sedna, you would not be picking up a yellow crayon and making a big circle when you drew the sky. You would be putting a, basically a white dot up in the sky. And so after Sedna was discovered, um, the estimates of its size range from about the size of Quar to almost the size of Pluto. And you might be wondering why is there that sort of range and estimate of the size? Well, it depends on what it's made of. And at this distance, it's really hard to tell sometimes what these objects are made of. So if it's mostly icy, it would reflect better. So it could be smaller and reflect the same amount of sunlight. If it's mostly rocky, then it would reflect more or reflect worse poorly, less. And so it would have to be bigger to reflect the same amount of light. And so that's why you, um, there's some uncertainty in the sizes of these objects. But once again, if you're going to call Pluto a planet, what are you going to call Sedna? And then these are the discovery images of the uh, object known as Eris, which was discovered in 2003. And then that's that little dot moving over on the left-hand side. But what's interesting about this object is that after watching that dot move for a while, we could estimate its orbital path and we see that it crosses the orbit of Pluto and it cross or brushes the orbit of Neptune. So it's out there in the Kuiper belt further away than Pluto. And this is an artist's representation of what uh, um, Eris would look like with the sun in the distance. 
And then when they did estimates of the diameter of Eris, then we got something that's about the size of Pluto, if not larger. And so what we know about um, this, the size of Eris, um, we think it's similar in diameter and similar in mass, if not a little bit more massive than Pluto. And it also has a moon. And so here are some uh, trans-Neptunian objects or Kuiper Belt objects. Uh, these are some of the large objects, not all of them, but some of the large objects out there past Neptune uh, to scale with the Earth. Um, you might have noticed, um, let me go back, Haumea is depicted as having a couple of moons in this. Um, we also have reason to think that it might have rings. And so we've discovered a couple of these objects uh, um, out in the distance that have rings, likely caused from a collision which chipped stuff off and that object went into orbit around it. And now this is when you have to get mad at astronomers and re always remind ourselves never to let astronomers name anything. So in 2018, um, objects further than Eris were observed. So Eris was at around 90 something astronomical units from the sun. To give you a sense of scale, the Earth is one astronomical unit away from the sun. And so Pluto is at about 40. And so you can see where Haumea, Quara, Makemake, Sedna, some of the other ones that we've mentioned tonight are in Eris. Well, in 2018, the furthest object we had yet discovered in the Kuiper Belt was discovered, so they nicknamed it Far Out at 120 astronomical units away. And then, then that same year, they discovered something that was a little bit further away at 180, 132 astronomical units away. And so they named it far, far out. And I take no responsibility for this. These are not the official names. These are just nicknames. They will eventually be renamed. But this is the sort of sense of scale. You can see um, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are way over to the left-hand side next to the sun. So this gives you sort of a good idea of how far away these objects are from the sun. You can see in the image above that the sun is depicted as just that bright dot again. And so what we should find out here in this part of the solar system is a lot of ice. It should be very cold out there and a lot of materials that can be in different forms out here than they can be uh, closer into the solar system. So now let's talk about the most famous Kuiper Belt object, Pluto. Um, Pluto was discovered in 1930 at, uh, at Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, and these are the discovery images, and you would have no chance of seeing Pluto in these discovery images if the arrows weren't pointing at them. In fact, Pluto is incredibly difficult to see, and we kind of got lucky uh, right now because Pluto's up in the constellation Sagittarius, which is where the heart of the Milky Way is from our point of view. There are a ton of stars in that direction. And what you're seeing here, those two lines are pointing at Pluto as Pluto is in front of a dark nebula from our point of view. Otherwise, it would just be lost amongst this sea of stars. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons uh, why Pluto was hard to find. As I mentioned earlier, Pluto is smaller than our own moon and it's really far out there in the solar system. So this is as good as the Hubble Space Telescope can do for Pluto. Um, the top image was from the mid 90s. The bottom image was from the early aughts. And uh, this is the entire surface of Pluto as seen from the Hubble Space Telescope. And this was even exciting because you might notice that the pattern of light and dark isn't in the same place. So it's like, oh, are the, the patterns of the ice changing? What's happening there? So as you can see um, from here on Earth, even with our best space telescope, Pluto is really hard to study. In fact, although Pluto was discovered in 1930, it wasn't until 1978 that we discovered its large moon, Eris, excuse me, Eris, Charon. And um, I put the Earth-Moon orbit uh, compared to the Pluto-Charon orbit on here. We think of the moon as going around the Earth, but when we talk about gravity, things orbit what we call a common center of mass. It's just that the Earth is so much bigger than the moon that that common center of mass is inside the Earth. And so, yes, the moon is orbiting the Earth. Well, Pluto and Charon, they're very similar in size. In fact, Charon's about half the size of Pluto. And so their common center of mass is in between them. And so they're co-orbiting this common center of mass. And so for those of you who are wondering why Pluto is no longer a planet, this is one of the, in 1978, things started to change in our understanding of Pluto. Because not only, I mean, should we call this a double planet now? You know, like what, 
this is not the same as the other planets, but this also allowed us for the first time to use Kepler's three laws of planetary motion to get a better idea of a mass and therefore its density. And so this, it's only since 1978 that we've gotten an idea of how small Pluto really is. So what I have here are the largest moons in the solar system, uh, Ganymede, Titan, Callisto, Io, our moon, Europa, Triton, and then that is a Hubble Space Telescope image of Pluto down there on the bottom right. And so Pluto is smaller than several moons in the solar system. It is almost the twin of Triton. Um, and uh, you might notice the coloration of Triton above Pluto there and the image of Pluto behind me. They're actually very similar, it turns out, to each other. Um, so uh, they have some common features. Speaking of moons, though, I told you Pluto had a large moon, Charon. But in 2006, two more moons were discovered, bringing it to three. Uh, in 2011, another moon discovered, bringing it to a total of four. And then in 2012, a fifth moon of Pluto was discovered. And so Pluto has five moons, uh, one really large one compared to its size, and then some smaller ones. And you might be wondering, why did we discover these so in such quick succession? Well, we were going to send a spacecraft to Pluto, and we didn't want it to run in into anything when it got there. And so this was basically surveys of the space around Pluto. And what's really amazing is when you look at this date, you'll realize these moons were discovered when that spacecraft was already on its way. And so it was basically trying to figure out if we needed to change the trajectory of the spacecraft. What spacecraft was it? It's the New Horizons spacecraft. Um, it was the fastest spacecraft that we ever launched off the launch pad. Um, it was launched in 2006 and got to Pluto in 2015. To give you a, a sense of scale there, um, oh, let's see. So it was launched in 2006. It passed the orbit of the moon in nine hours. It passed the orbit of Jupiter in a year. And so uh, space is big and Pluto's really far is the moral of that story. But when it got to Pluto, we could finally see images of some of these objects close up for the first time. And these are, these are images of the small moons of Pluto that were discovered while the New Horizons spacecraft was on its way, Styx, Nix, Kerberos, and Hydra. And what's particularly interesting is that Kerberos and Hydra have shapes that almost make it look like two objects ran into each other and merged. And uh, keep that thought in mind. I'm going to show you another example of that. But this is as good as we got of, um, of images of these moons. This is Karen, though, and what a beautiful, amazing world that this is. It shows great complexity on the surface. We see craters, hints of a violent history, this huge canyon that stretches over a thousand miles in length. Um, the region south of the canyon has fewer craters than north of the canyon. So what does that mean about the geology that happened in between those two hemispheres? We've got that reddish region up towards the, the, the northern part uh, from this point of view, um, which usually is, uh, has, is a material um, that has tholins in it, which are organic compounds that we don't see naturally here on Earth, but we see them out in space. And so, um, and this is Karen and Pluto to size scale and to color scale with each other. And so now we see these two objects that um, just, they look, their, their coloration is different. They're not made out of the same stuff. What makes them different? And then look at Pluto. Pluto's amazing. And look at this huge, smooth surface on it. All right, because Pluto doesn't have much of an atmosphere, hardly any atmosphere at all. And so the rule of thumb is, is that if there isn't an atmosphere or a very thick atmosphere, then the surface is just going to get hit by stuff. And the, the, the longer or the older the surface, the longer it's been exposed to the elements, in this case, getting hit the more craters it should have. And so we thought, I mean, when I, this is my, my husband always reminds me that I was refreshing Twitter to see the first images of Pluto coming back from the spacecraft. And I started crying because, you know, to me, the best image, of, remember the best image of Pluto previous to this were pixels from the Hubble Space Telescope, right? And so he always teases me because I like burst into tears when I was seeing this. But one of the reasons was that smooth spot on Pluto means that it's geologically active. 
there's something going on there to resurface Pluto. Otherwise, it would be uh, full of craters. And this is um, ice, uh, but not a water ice. It's rich in nitrogen ice, uh, methane ice, and carbon monoxide ice. Um, the New Horizons spacecraft was flying really, really fast. It was going over 35,000 miles per hour when it got out there because Pluto doesn't have, if we didn't send it fast, we couldn't get out there. Remember, it took nine years to get there to begin with. So this was just a flyby mission because in order for Pluto's small gravity to capture it, it would have had to have been going really slow and we'd still be waiting for it to get there. And so it is a trade-off. So as it flew by, it um, took images uh, with Pluto being back illuminated by the sun. And that's when you can see Pluto does have a thin atmosphere. You can, that's the, what the wispiness is above it. And you are also seeing um, these mountains. And let's zoom in a bit more because uh, these just, this image is just one of those things that I could stare at for hours. You're seeing, once again, smooth surfaces that are made out of ices of carbon monoxide, nitrogen. We got some water ice there. And those mountains that you see are water ice mountains that are like a mile, two miles high. They're huge. It's amazing. And so Pluto, Pluto's way too interesting to be a planet. And don't feel bad for Pluto that it's no longer considered a planet. Um, uh, it, it, it outclasses us. So that was Pluto. Those are the images that we got of Pluto. But the spacecraft is still going. <laughs> you know, it just flew by, took pictures, and kept going. And so the question was, will the spacecraft last long enough to maybe pass by something else out there? Because we'd never sent a spacecraft this far before. Or at least that was still working. That was its intention. You know, the Voyager spacecrafts are further out, but they're no longer actively doing science. So there, we know roughly where Pluto is on the sky. That's the search field. Uh, and so the question is, could we find anything else out there along the trajectory of the spacecraft or close enough to the trajectory that we could continue to send the New Horizons spacecraft out towards it? And so this is how um, 2014 MU69, now known as Arakoth, was discovered. But it was discovered in 2014, which is actually, you know, just the year before uh, the New Horizons spacecraft got to Pluto. And so this is the case where we found the object that we were going to send the spacecraft to next years after the spacecraft had been launched. And so we sent it and... So this is sort of the orientation of the orbit. And so let me pause this back again. And so we have Pluto's orbit is that white orbit and then Arakoth's orbit is this orange orbit. And then um, how do we know what to expect when we got there? So we were trying to figure out a little bit like, you know, we want to know kind of the size and the orientation of this object. And so in 2017, this object passed in front of a star from the Earth's perspective and it blocked the starlight. And so by studying how it blocked the starlight, we could try to get an estimate of its shape. And so it was predicted it should have this sort of shape, right? So let's see if they were right. So um, the New Horizons spacecraft was at Pluto in July of 2015. At the end, basically on January 1st, 2019, is when we got to Arakoth. So here it is on December 29th, pixels. Here we are now on December 31st of 2018, and we're starting to see a shape to it. In fact, uh, over time, they took images. You could even get it rotating. And then here it is on December 31st, estimated size of about, you know, a little over 10 miles there. And then the difference between December 31st and January 1st and what we could see, it kind of gives you an idea of how fast the spacecraft was going. Because remember, it's still going at like 35,000 miles an hour. It's just going. And so it's taking images as fast as it can as it keeps flying by. And so it turns out that this object is about 21 miles long. And it reminds us of our one of our favorite droids, BB-8. It's kind of the shape. And quite frankly, um, that is an estimated true color image of what it should, of Eric, 
Erikoth should look like. So yeah, kind of reminds us of BB-8. And it might also remind you of uh, a comet that was visited by the European Space Agency's Rosetta spacecraft. So the image on the left is Erikoth, that Kuiper Belt object. The image on the right is Comet 67P. And Comet 67P, where it looks like the two spheres are joining, we actually think it was a merger because the ice in that region is smoother. Like these two objects ran into each other, melted, like the energy of the impact melted the ice and fused them together. And if you take a look at um, Erikoth, you'll notice that bright band of light almost looking like a necklace joining those two spheres. And it is likely a, a merger. So what we think happened is that these two objects formed and came together and merged together. Um, but it might not even be spherical. Uh, data actually shows that what looks like BB-8 uh, from another perspective might be kind of flat. And so uh, we didn't see the whole, we, we didn't, from the data that we got, we can extrapolate what the whole object should look like as it spins. But this is the, closest up image of a small Kuiper Belt object that we have. Erikoth out there past Pluto, the New Horizon spacecraft is still going. And I have not heard yet whether or not there is another object along its path for it to discover before it runs out of its um, battery life or out of its power, but hopefully it will because um, it has been amazing to see these objects out there not necessarily exactly what we would have expected them to look like. And uh, between this, uh, the comet 67P and those moons of Pluto also indicating that mergers might be more frequent than we think out there, either via collisions or formation processes of somehow of making these objects out in the Kuiper Belt. So hopefully you have enjoyed that tour of the Kuiper Belt. And then uh, Andrea, should I stop sharing? Yes, that would be great. He looks a little bit like a sad snowman. I could see some eyes and the buttons. And yeah, the there's some people do refer to it as a, as a snowman, but you know yeah. me, I go straight to the Star Wars references. So oh. that's totally BB-8 to me. <laughs> I do not fault you for that, for sure. <laughs> and we have some questions, just as a reminder, and I should have said that before, you have a Q&A function that you can use to engage with Lisa, and uh, you can just type your questions in there and we will get to them. So we have one question, what is your favorite feature of Pluto? We might, that question was typed early, so we heard a lot um, till then, but um, I would still love for you to talk about it. My favorite feature of Pluto is that it's so much more interesting than we ever would have thought. Like I said, we did not expect this smooth surface right here. We expected all the craters. We expected an older surface. So the idea of finding this world out there that has some young surfaces on it so that it's geologically active, that was unexpected and awesome. And so that's one of the things I love about it. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I just launched a little poll. We're always interested in hearing what you think about the event. So I just did a little audience questionnaire. Why you listen to the Q&A? If you could take a second to just fill that out, we would very much appreciate it. Thank you very much. Next question, how do we determine how many, what was it? Astro astronomical units. There you go, away these objects are. All right, so in the solar system, we have things a little bit easier um, than we do when trying to figure out distances further away. Um, so first of all, we understand um, gravity. Uh, and their first attempt at that was Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Kepler's laws of planetary motion was experimentally figuring out the way gravity worked before Newton came up with his law of universal gravitation. And so what we can do is we can watch how they move. And once we realize the shape and size of their ellipse, we can figure out how far away they are. There are other ways though, that we can do it for objects in the inner solar system. Like we can bounce radar off the moon, uh, off Venus, off Mercury, off of close by asteroids and use good old distance equals rate times time for when we get the radar echo back to try to figure out how far objects are away. There's also uh, things like parallax and so on. But uh, for a lot of these, sometimes our first estimate does come from uh, just our understanding of how gravity works. Thank you. Um, are Eumea's rings egg-shaped too? Um, so that's an interesting question because Haumea is sort of oddly shaped, but uh, the orbit, the gravity just says that the orbital shape has to be an ellipse and the most stable orbit tends to be a circle above the equator, above the rotational axis, above the, the equator with respect to the uh, 
rotation axis. And so it's very likely that they are mostly circular. Rings tend to, okay, this is a word I think only astronomers use, but rings tend to circularize. Like the crossing orbits take each other out. So what's left behind are the not crossing orbits and the not crossing orbits are going to be mostly circular. That's, yeah, that's something to think about right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, we have another question. Is there a leading hypothesis on the cause of the geological activity on Pluto? You know, there probably is. I know there's a, still a lot of debate. They're still really sifting through the data that came back because it can't be, I mean, we can think that maybe Karen has enough tidal stresses on Pluto that maybe it's keeping Pluto geologically active, much like the um, geological, geological stresses on the Galilean satellites of Jupiter is part of what keeps them geologically active. So that could be one thing. But otherwise, it's actually, it's hard to know. Uh, for other parts of the solar system, we see things like, I mean, is this cryovolcanism? Are there still sort of volcanic hot spots that bring forth ice? Um, we, it, it's still not completely known, but it sure is interesting to think about. So we would have to get a rover on Pluto too. To actually it would be, you know, that would be a that would be amazing. It would just take such a long time for that mission to happen because you can't jolt those rovers around. And then the hugest problem is that Pluto's so small that the spacecraft can't be going very fast. Otherwise, Pluto's gravity won't capture it. And so, um, because I've I had students ask me, it's like, well, well, why didn't we land? And it's like, because we'd still be waiting another 20 years for the spacecraft to get there if it was going that slow. And so it was a cost benefit analysis there. And so that's why it's still racing out of the solar system really, really quickly out there in the Kuiper belt. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you do have to weigh yeah. the costs and the benefits. That makes sense. It's not yeah. cheap to go to space. It is not cheap. And in those cases, the people who start the project wouldn't be the same people who ended the project when you're talking about a, a spacecraft mission that takes decades like that. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. So you've got this beautiful image of Pluto behind you and there are some red spots. And there's a question, how did the red spots form? Do we know about that? So there is um, an organic compound known as a tholin that when it interacts with uh, the radiation from the sun, so basically solar radiation, makes this sort of reddish color. We see this in the atmosphere of Titan, which is um, Saturn's largest moon. It's one of the reasons why Titan's atmosphere is orange. Um, we see uh, indications of this material as well in some of the icy moons of the uh, the giant planets. And so it's likely just um, these organic compounds that, you know, um, our ozone layer protects us from ultraviolet radiation. So the same compound here on Earth wouldn't interact with the, the sunlight the same way and make the same colors. And so there are labs, uh, most notably one uh, from Sarah Horst at uh, Johns Hopkins, if I recall correctly, where she makes uh, astrophysical ices in a lab and tries to see how they behave. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. What a fun job that would be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have another question. When did we lose contact with Voyager 1 and 2? Um, we haven't completely lost contact. Um, they're no longer doing science, really. Um, Voyager 2 is still sending little pings back going, I'm here, I'm here. And it still has its magnetometer on to try to take magnetic field data. So that's how it knows when it's left the sun's magnetic field. And we think it's left the heliopause or past what we call the heliopause. Um, it will likely not be talking to us much longer because it's battery powered and these were launched in the 70s. And so that actually determines how long that they can talk to us. So what's what happened was after they finished uh, observing the planets that they intended to observe, a lot of the instrumentations got closed down so that the battery only had to power a few instruments so it could talk back to us. Voyager, Voyager 2 is still talking. It's just, just every now and then, just a little ping. <laughs> It's interesting, a, a battery that lasts for 30 years in space and we can get our car battery to last uh, 
you know, on the Loire. Well, you, you know, but it, but it's interesting though, because remember once you launch these spacecraft, they just keep going, right? Keep going. Your, your car actually in many ways has to work harder every day than, uh, definitely, uh, but there's also a big difference between 30 years and this. And I know, you know, I know. just being a snarky, so apologize for that. <laughs> All right, but we have great questions here. Why are suddenly so many countries going to Mars? Are countries getting ready for some exodus from Earth? Which could, I mean, you know, or yeah. did someone discover gold or rare metals on planets? You know, the, the answer is actually just a little bit simpler than that. It's the easiest planet to explore. Um, in terms of Venus is just a downright nasty planet. I mean, it has sulfuric acid in its atmosphere. The, the runaway greenhouse effect means its atmospheric pressure is like 90 times the atmospheric pressure of the earth. And so it's just, we would be sending, cause it's so similar to the earth in terms of its size and its, its mass and its gravity. We'd be sending, and we actually have sent tons. I mean, until recently, I think only recently Mars has uh, superseded how often Venus was um, visited in the 70s and the 80s. So especially the former Soviet Union had a lot of successful missions um, to Venus. But um, Mars is just, I mean, literally easier. It is more Earth-like in terms of its surface. Its atmosphere, we can't breathe it, but it's thin and it's not um, acidic or nasty to the instrumentation. And so uh, I don't want to say it's easy because space flight is never easy but it is the um the easiest in many way to explore the surface in terms of rovers for us and also you know we tend to think rare earth metals or something like gold or something like that but actually the key to mars is water um we know that there's water ice in the clouds we know there's water ice ice in the soil the question is and in the ice caps of mars the question is is there still liquid water below the surface because if there's liquid water there then suddenly that is a place where people can go and we don't have to send everything we need um there with them with so it, it, water is the currency of the solar system if, if, if you really want to talk about what you need yeah but i, I it is an interesting question is I, you know are so many countries just looking for possible habitable planets because you know, we're running Earth a little bit into the ground. <laughs> I actually really just think in terms of, um, since so many spacecraft have been there before, it's a really good test of like, here's some known technology, can we replicate it? And so NASA's done this, the European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, the you know, so it's like, let's, you know, we now have a standard method now by which we land rovers on Mars, you know, yeah. we, so it, it, I think it's more, proof of concept and the continuation. And so it, it, we almost get used to these spacecraft missions working now and it's every time it's frightening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad to see so many um, because I think every time we learn so much new information and it just, I think it's wonderful. Well, and I, I always like to remind people that when we study space, we're really studying ourselves because um, if what we think should work on Mars or on Pluto isn't working, that means we don't understand that process here either. And so it's, it's not as completely divorced from the Earth as it might sound like as we explore other worlds. Yeah. Oh, that's a good reminder. I like that. Um, next question is, how much longer does New Horizon have in battery and fuel before it stops reporting back to us? You know, as far as I know, just a couple other, couple more years, but there's always methods that they try to extend battery life, like cycling certain, certain instrumentation on and off and turning certain things off while it's coasting. Um, as far as I know, I haven't, I don't recall an announcement of it finding a next um, object along its path though yet. Uh, so I keep hoping, I keep hoping. And I gotta ask, um, so you said they're turning things on and off. New Horizon is far, far away, mm -hmm. obviously, and it, um, and the data communication, there's got to be a super lag. Like, how does yes. that work? How long is the lag and how does that work? So, so the lag is several hours at this point, but what tends to happen is they don't, um, it's not like game video game play. They tend to load up like here is a week's worth, a month's worth, several months worth of commands at a time. And so they're not, and, and that's, and that's a great question because especially the further away these missions are, the, the bigger the lag is in terms of uh, talking to them via radio signals. 
So that also means you do have to leave some instrumentation on because in terms of emergencies, you need to give them the ability to go like, oh no, I need to turn this off or oh no, I need to do this as much as they possibly can go into safe mode or something like that. So you can't turn them off completely and just let them go. Something always has to be on, but there is a discussion, right? Of like, okay, how many instruments can we power down so we can keep, extend the battery power the longest? So yeah, I need to start poking around more and seeing if uh, New Horizons can keep going much longer because I think the estimate I'd seen previously was 2022, 2023, and that sounded like it was a long way in the future and it's not anymore. Yeah, that's very true. All of a sudden, <laughs> yes. 2020 was gone in a blur. That sure yeah. didn't help. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm still blurry. Yeah. Um, we have a couple more questions and we're... As always, we're going to go a little over because we love the question. So um, it's amazing that the team at NASA was able to figure out the trajectory for New Horizon to reach Pluto, totally agree, and avoid crashing into any objects out in the Kuiper Belt. But how do they do that? How do they figure the trajectory without like hitting something on the way? You know, and that's why I wanted to mention how they were searching for moons of Pluto and possible rings of Pluto and stuff like that, because it is really hard to find stuff objects out in so objects in the solar system you know the only thing that's really emitting a lot of its own light is the sun um the planets emit in the infrared a little but they're not emitting huge amounts of light mostly we see these objects by reflected sunlight so if you're talking small objects really far away they're not hardly reflecting anything so they're really hard to see so even with all the best efforts that they did there was still a chance that the spacecraft could have run into something you know, when we first sent the Pioneer spacecraft out to Jupiter in the 1970s, part of the goal of that mission wasn't just to get to Jupiter. It was proof of concepts that you could fly through the asteroid belt because we could identify the larger asteroids. But was it riddled with like tiny little hailstone size bits of asteroid all, all throughout? Um, th those were things that you couldn't actually know till you get there. Yeah. And so um, it is amazing that it could get that far out there. It tells you once again that space is big and mostly empty. Um, we were just, you know, sometimes so you just got to hope you don't go into one of the accidentally dense regions on your way. It's true. And I would assume there's lots of math and uh, physics involved too. Lots of math, lots of it. I always like to say, though, that we've had the physics figured out since the 1700s. It's the engineers that had to catch up. <laughs> nice. <laughs> We're not going to tell the engineers. It's all good. <laughs> Next question is, why does Mars look like a regular day on Earth? Regular day as in now gloomy regular days. Isn't that amazing, though, yeah. um, how, how familiar it looks? Awesome. Um, Mars has an atmosphere that has clouds. It gets high cirrus clouds made out of water ice. It gets carbon dioxide ice clouds. It has fog that forms in the valleys. There, it has Mars has weather. It doesn't have a thick atmosphere, but it does have one. Um, we see uh, dust devils. We see winds. We see sandstorms. So Mars actually does have weather and. Um, and wind and just like those formations can form in the Earth's atmosphere, they can form in the Martian atmosphere as well. Yeah, I mean, it really looks like they just went out to the desert and took a picture. You know? oh, but I think that's one of the, you know, that gets back to the like, um, if we understand how things work here, then we should understand it there. And I think part of what's amazing sometimes is it's like, that just really did look like just stepping outside here in the Southwest, right? Yeah. Um, you know, go to New Mexico during the monsoon season. And that's exactly what it looks like. So I love, I love the familiarity of Mars. I could look at pictures of Mars from the rovers for just hours. I have looked at the Mars <laughs> pictures for hours. I'm with you on that one. I'm the same way. Um, the, so we're calling the Kuiper belt a belt. Is that because it's flat or is it more like a bubble or how can we it's imagine a donut. that? It's a donut of icy objects that start at about the orbit of Neptune. So Pluto is firmly in it and it extends, you know, we used to think it only extended about 20 or 30 AU, but it might be a little bit bigger than that. And then we think there was a significant gap between that and the Oort cloud, which would be a sphere of comets really, really far away um, from the solar system. And that's where the long period comets would come from. And the short period comets should actually be coming from the Kuiper belt. Okay. By period, I mean the length of time it takes them to orbit the sun. Yes. 
And speaking of, of time and how long things take, why do we look back in time when we look into the night sky? I love that question. So I think in many ways, it's easier to talk about now because all of you now have probably waited for a video to buffer before it starts playing when you stream. And so think of the distance between you and a star as being sort of a buffer. The light turns on it takes that buffer time before it gets to you but once the light reaches you it streams continuously and so depending on how far an object is away you have to build in that time for the light that you're currently seeing to have traveled to you so even the moon um the moon uh, is not up tonight i think it's uh, up i think it's in the waning crescent phase so it'll be up before dawn tomorrow but when you look at the moon, you're not even seeing the moon right now. You're seeing it as it was about one second ago because the moon is a little bit over one light second away from the earth. The, earth. the sun is about 8.3 light minutes. So when you see the sun in the sky, the, the light you feel from the sun took over eight minutes to get to you. So even the light that's on that you feel is uh, reaching you from the past. And it's just sort of, a, a you know, and then the solar system is a few light hours across and the distance to the closest star is a little over four light years. And so when you're looking at stars up in the sky, you're seeing the light from them years to centuries ago. And then the most distant galaxies we see, the light left to them about 12 billion years ago, almost 13 billion years ago. What I love about that is that means that we're looking at the light from objects that started on its way to us before our solar system even formed. It's like, we weren't even here yet to be a target for that light when that light left those objects. And so um, I always love talking about this stuff. I always end up talking about this to students towards the end of the semester. And they're like, Dr. Will, stop making my head hurt like this. Because yeah. it's really wild to think about, but really amazing too. And so, yeah, yeah. I go, go, absolutely yeah, go outside at night and look in, out into the past, right? Yeah, it's super wild. Well, thank you so much. We answered all the questions we had so far. I'm super happy about that. Um, just a couple of quick reminders. We are back live and virtual in July. On July 7th, I accidentally typed June 7th. <laughs> I call it the COVID brain. Um, but yeah, so in, in July 7th, we're going to be back in person at 7. And at 8.15, we're going to have an online show. So we're going to do the hybrid model for a little while. I do hope that you come and join us on that July 7th for the life, especially if you've never done it before. I promise you, we will blow you away because you sit under the stars. We fly you through the universe. I mean, we fly you towards objects like Pluto. And it's just an amazing trip and it's i think still one of the best date nights in san diego you know grab some dinner afterwards in the beautiful outdoor spaces in balboa park and just make it a romantic stargazing night and i love it it's perfect and we can't wait to get back to that um if you are just as interested as i am in uh car batteries <laughs> we do we do I, I need a new car so that's why my brain is automatically going to car batteries because i'm thinking electric um, car possibly. Anywho, we will have a talk in October for Sats and Science that will examine exactly that. We have a car, uh, at least a battery scientist with us who's going to tell us all the latest and the greatest in the battery research. We hope that that might be in person again, but the whole, that program uh, takes place in bars and restaurants and you know, that is still a little bit more difficult to uh, gauge and plan than our building is. So I'm not entirely sure when we will bring sets and science back in person, but in August, either online or in person, we can look at batteries. And of course we have events before then too, still online in July. All right, that was it for my little marketing spiel. I appreciate you <laughs> listening to that and being interested in all that we have to offer. You've been a wonderful audience over the last uh, 12, more than 12 months and supporting us by being here, purchasing tickets that have gone to support our mission and our staff in putting these on. We would not have been able to do that without all of you and we can't thank you enough for loving science and especially astronomy so much that you continued to write this out with us um, until we can finally see each other in person in July. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Good night. Bye.